Hello and welcome to Hampton Court Palace. This is the King's Staircase that Wren built. It leads to 207 bedrooms, 10 kitchens, 288 historic works of art, all part of the Queen's Royal Collection. And down there was the Great House of Easement, an enormous communal toilet seating 28 people at a time. But there's far more to Hampton Court than ancient bricks and mortar and historic bathrooms. A lot of human effort goes into making it all run smoothly. In fact, there's a whole community here running Britain's largest royal palace. 523 people live or work within the palace walls. And it's their lives we're going to be dipping into. I hope you can join us. Henry VIII is the monarch most closely associated in the public mind with Hampton Court. The buildings of Henry's royal palace have changed dramatically, but it's here in the 60 acres of formal gardens that Henry left a lasting legacy, innovative in design and a milestone in the history of British gardening. Were the much-married king to return today, he might still recognise parts of the gardens where he wooed Catherine, and Jane, and The task of safeguarding and developing Henry's legacy falls to Deputy Gardens and Estate Manager Graham Dillamore, usually wearing his distinctive hat, and his deputy Gary Wise. The two of them don't always see eye to eye when it comes to garden design. Nice combination. Yeah, you've got to use this one again. It would be nice to get all the colours. What a shame, <laughs> what a shame we got the red in, mixed in with the purple. That was deliberate. We put that there deliberately. Ah. Oh. Carry on past it. I see. They blend in well. You accidentally drifted a box of red through the purple. Yes. Our Tuesday morning's <laughs> walk around is, 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 is a highlight of the week for me. It's a nice time for us to get together, isn't it, and have a look at the gardens and see yeah. what kind of condition it is. Tuesdays are times we normally, if we're going to have a battle, this is when we have a battle. Mm. This is when I say to him, this needs to be done, and he says, no, this doesn't need to be done. I think we have that out as well, because I think that looks... Yeah. The white was even worse. We've got white over there. Yeah. Uh, we just took it all out. Gary dreads Most some things about Tuesday, don't you, because some things you try and hide. So you'll try and steer me around the gardens in an opposite direction to what we normally do, or, or um, we'll whiz over a part that you've really made a <laughs> mess of, or something like that. I don't think that. so. I think you go here in the gardens. <laughs> it's really clean, isn't it, Tulip? Mm. You can almost eat it. It looks like ice cream. Yeah. Day-to-day -day running of the gardens falls to Gary. Graham, his boss, looks after the £1.5 million budget, the overall colour scheme, and the grand design of the gardens. But he still likes to keep his hand in. I like to meddle in what was going on and get involved and uh, we need to talk about that, and it? interfere as much as I can, really, yeah. because I can't let go, obviously, like most managers. No. And but he won't move offices. <laughs> I'd ask him. He won't move offices. <laughs> We've never fallen out seriously no. over gardening, but um, yeah. Gary I has... I some... come more from the core blimey school of gardening, yeah. I think is what it's called. I come from, I come from Eastbourne, and in Eastbourne you have big, bold beds, beds that shout at you and say, come and look at me. And Graham, on the other hand, doesn't like big, bold bits. No, no, I'm a bit more sophisticated. And I think we, we, we're a bit too uh, cruel on the public. Oh, we don't give them enough credit for their taste. I mean, the flowers in the beds, I think you've got to sort of design carefully, I think, because they... But the, the, <laughs> an area this size, I always said, needs to shout at you. It's too big. Yeah. And you, so there's areas we can have more sophisticated bedding. Yeah. This is a big area. It's got 53 flower beds out here. They need to shout. They need to say, come and look at me. Yeah, you Otherwise, can't be too wishy-washy, can you? No. But it's not seaside bedding. We're not seeing. <laughs> like you'd have us believe. <laughs> You'll have deck chairs and candy floss up here next. <laughs> Funny you say that. <laughs> the east front at 25 acres is the largest of the palace gardens and dates from the 17th century. The garden originally started off as the Great Fountain Garden and out here there would have been 13 fountains and a huge parterre garden which is small low clipped box hedges and coloured gravels and some flowers. But then it changed and developed and, and different monarchs came and went uh, and gardening tastes generally changed. Uh, and what we have now really is, a, is the remains of the Victorian era. Nearly three quarters of a million visitors are welcomed to Hampton Court each year, but there's also a lot of unwanted guests. For centuries, palace staff have fought to save the building from the attacks of insect pests, eating their way through the fabric of this historic royal home. 
There's a particular problem with pests in the Tudor kitchens. The first line of defence is the four strong team of trained conservators who clean and care for the building on a day to day basis. They're led by head housekeeper Caroline Allington. Yes, definitely. This roll here has actually got some of the larvae still sticking out of it, which is quite amazing. They haven't actually all run away. There's one here, there's one here, and this is all the stuff they've eaten away. They've been quite busy then, haven't they? They've been very busy. Look, there's another one sticking out there. The larvae are from moths, which are breeding in the bread rolls on display in the kitchen. For authenticity, real bread rolls are used, coated in resin to preserve them. But that hasn't deterred the moth. I mean, these pretty stupid moths generally to be going through the resin, because it can't be very pleasant for them. <laughs> must be hungry. Once they've got through, they've got uh, you know, bread inside, so supposedly a, a, a moth that likes mouldy grain. Yes. That's probably very likely. It's really interesting. I think we should keep this one, a treasure. But in the battle to repel this invasion, they're going to need expert help. Not a very effective way of removing them, is it? <laughs> well, we've got an expert coming in this afternoon who's hopefully going to spray everything and take care of all the infestation here. Housekeeper Caroline wages a constant war against insects. Their target, the priceless and irreplaceable contents of the palace. I don't like larvae. I don't like squishy things at all. And they're the ones that do all the damage. And, of course, I'm very thorough about trying to be sure there aren't any as I'm scared of them. Tapestries are made of silk, wool, gold and silver threads and both the silk and the wool are susceptible to insect attack. You can actually sometimes see small larvae on the front, woolly bears, the larvae of the carpet beetle are called because they actually collect little hairs around themselves. If it was moth you might actually see a moth on it but it is the larvae again who do all the damage who actually eat the little holes in the tapestry. On the rails here, I'm just going to see if we've got any new woodworm damage. Underneath the upholstery, that's where we have to look. Woodworm eat the wood and leave a dusty trail of droppings called frass. It's quite easy sometimes to think that you've got an active infestation when actually all you've got is old frass coming out of the holes. We don't obviously want to treat the stool unnecessarily. Caroline isn't the only one on pest patrol. Part of assistant curator Jonathan Foyle's job is to protect the fabric of the building. So he regularly tours areas hidden from public view, where insects may have begun their assault. Today he's up in the attic of the palace's west front. I'm looking for any signs of Death Watch beetle. There's a lot of indication there's woodworm around some of these small holes. They're about a millimetre and a half, two millimetres look like woodworm. But I saw some larger holes in this area. And I thought I saw um, a pupa in there. Now, just when I, when I touched this piece of bark, it was actually very loose and very fragile, and for a good reason, because um, it has lots of uh, sawdust along the back of it, which is symptomatic of uh, beetles gnawing away at wood and, um, and sort of kicking it with their back legs um, and, and, and making areas of timber uh, fairly loose. So. It'll be worth looking um, around here to see if there are any further signs of, of, of beetle. Sometimes you can hear that knocking sound. They rub their back legs together in the same way that crickets do in order to attract a mate. It's a signal kind of call. Now, that's why they're called Death Watch Beetle, because the knocking sound sounds like a ticking clock. Um, they've come into legend as, as um, in making the noise of a clock which is counting your hours away of, of existence. So that's why they're called Death Watch Beetle. <laughs> Up along here, along the archways along here, you can see we've got the cobwebs up around the archway here. And those are where we find the cardinal spiders, actually up in the webs, in the arches. They're called cardinal spiders because they've got a cross on them. And they're so named after Cardinal Woolsey, who was, of course, the first owner of the palace here. They just want the spiders inside in the state apartments, building webs across our paintings or anything. And to remove them, the cobwebs are slightly sticky, so we don't want to risk removing any bits of paint with it, so we try not to. So we do try to discourage them from within the apartments, but they're very welcome out here to catch the flies for us. For hundreds of years, the Tudor stairs have served as breakfast, lunch and dinner for generations of Death Watch beetle. So they're closely monitored by Jonathan. These are the servant steps, and they link the kitchens to the hall. So all of the food for Henry VIII's courtiers would have been brought up these steps. It's ironic, really, that the steps themselves are now providing food for beetles. 
we treat it as a disease of the building. And so we owe it to the building to, to make a check and, and to keep score of how the building's doing. This is a dead one, actually, so um, I don't know quite how long that's been there. I think something with a hard shell <laughs> could remain dead for a long time. Um, it doesn't really tell us very much. Uh, but I thought I noticed up here a live one, so that it may be active, um, which spells bad news for the, for, the, for the building over the long terms. It's run away, actually, which at least proves that the thing's live, but it would be nice, nice to be able to collect a specimen. Chemical treatment could harm the timbers, and to cut out the infected areas could fatally weaken the stairs. But for now, Jonathan isn't unduly worried. Through my observations, it doesn't seem that the building's really in any danger of collapse or anything half as drastic. I mean, those steps have had 500 years almost to get to that condition, and so it may be a very slow process. Meanwhile, on their Tuesday tour, Graham and Gary have reached the Privy Garden, or King's Private Garden, which was restored in 1995 to its original 18th century glory. It was built for William and Mary uh, in 1702, and the garden then reflected their own personal tastes in gardening. But the formal garden really was at its peak when this garden was built. It's all about man's power over nature, isn't it? Yeah. How I can turn this lovely looking tree into a grotesque <laughs> shape that, that no one would recognise. It's showing, it's demonstrating how powerful the king is, because he is really powerful and he can buy all these yew trees and really control how they grow uh, and show to his, say to his mates, look at that, I've got one of them, you haven't got one of them. <laughs> you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like this. <laughs> and I've got 400 of them. <laughs> Looking nice though, isn't it? Hanging on, not in bed. Philadelphus. Can you see what I mean about Philadelphus? Yeah. They're huge. Well, I don't like them. Yeah. Far too big. It's just started to look quite nice. It's like the thing's only just been started growing nicely and you want to hack it to pieces. Can't we just leave it alone for a few more months? It's too big. It's not. It's perfect. It's, it's not beautiful. Too big. It takes over the garden. It dominates. It why, shouldn't why dominate. Why cut it to pieces now? Just, just leave it. Leave it alone. I don't agree with that. For me, a garden should have a wow factor. You should walk into that garden and go, wow. I don't think this garden has the wow factor. I think it's, it's, it's very delicate and it just blends in all nicely together. And it, I say, it needs to be viewed from the roof. Then it has. It's a bit of a balancing act, is, is trying to maintain the historical integrity of the gardens, which is really important. But at the same time, we've got visitors who enjoy flowers and enjoy mm. beautiful looking gardens, and we've got to make sure they look attractive. Mm. And I think we do it. I think we do it very well. I think we should take the building away and just build another garden there. Make another maze, wouldn't it? Make another maze in the palace, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I maze. think the building spoils the garden, don't you? Back at the kitchens, a specialist bug buster arrives to deal with the problem moths. His mission is to stop the insects invading other areas of the palace, where objects more valuable than bread rolls could be on the moth's menu. I think you've got one. Have I? Bob Child is a world expert in ridding historic buildings of pests. <laughs> I tried to capture one in a film canister. <laughs> I want, a, I want a nice chequered one to go with the grey one we've got. It won't land! It won't land! You'll never do it. You'll never do it. We did. We decanted it into a seal-type bag, and that's more speckled than the other one. Yeah. That's why they're sometimes called, you know, the sooty moth, because it looks as if they soot on a silvery background. They're like most clothes moths. They flutter. They don't fly elegantly. They just sort of hop and mm. flutter and, and, and run about and scuttle. How we actually try and catch them very often is, is by um, using their pheromones, their sex pheromones. And I, I think it's the dirtiest trick in the book because it's always the female sex pheromones that they use, right. that they synthesize chemically. And they put it out and all the males emerge from bread rolls as moths. And they've only got sex, that's the only thing on their minds. And they can smell it wafting through the air and they'll zoom round. Um, onto the trap and get stuck on the trap then. Oh, so. very disappointed male moths. Indeed, they die of oh. frustration. But will Bob's attempts to remove the moths end in frustration too? Or will sex be his secret weapon? The great vine is one of the oldest and largest vines in the world. 
It was planted by the famous gardener Lancelot Capability Brown in 1768, and he took the cutting from a manor house in Ilford in Essex. Jill Cox has tended the vine for the last 13 of its 230 years, and her job title is as extraordinary as the work she does. She is the keeper of the great vine. The plant itself is pretty hardy, it's been here a long time. It's producing the fruit that's slightly more tricky every year. Although my husband always says if it dies, you know, I should straight up the tower and then... Michael, I think he says that really when he's a little bit fed up with me, you know, when he has a slight off day. <laughs> Most of vine keeping involves um, curbing its natural exuberance, you know, hacking bits off at every stage. <laughs> it produces a huge crop every year. Um, and I could let it have a huge crop one year, and it would probably never fruit again. It would almost certainly start fruiting very erratically. Um, so I control the size of the crop every year. And I start off by reducing the number of bunches down to about a 1,000. And then I thin each individual bunch, which is what I'm doing now. And the idea is to thin each individual bunch by a third to a half. Um, and I want to keep the overall shape of the bunch uh, so I'm looking to remove the ones that are on the inside. Jill has to be careful not to touch the grapes in case she rubs off their bloom, a natural defence against mildew. She's got a lot of ground to cover. After 230 years of growth, the vine stem now has a girth of 78 inches and its longest branch measures 114 feet. Jill's boss, nursery manager Tony Bolding, knows the importance of the care she lavishes on it. The vine is very well pampered, um, possibly we give it a bit more attention than it uh, really deserves, but uh, being such an old plant, it does require a, a lot of attention, in as much that uh, whoever looks after it has a great responsibility and a great amount of history that they're taking care of there, and you wouldn't want to be known as the person that killed the vine at Hampton Court. People often say, don't I have nightmares about it dying? Um, and I don't. No, I don't, because, you know, I can sort of see that it's OK. Um, I, I usually have a few anxious moments in August because it would be possible to lose the whole crop with something like botrytis. I mean, it's never happened, um, sort of touch wood. But, uh, you know, it, just at that last stage, I want them to be ripe and then I want to cut them. And uh, I usually heave a great sigh of relief when they've all gone, hey, thank goodness for that, you know, another crop sort of safely delivered. The vine's harvested in late August and early September, and it produces six to seven hundred pounds of black Hamburg grapes. The sweet red fruit was traditionally eaten by the royal household, and then in 1930, George V started sending the grapes to hospitals, and within five years, they were being sold to visitors to the palace. Today, the crop is still sold in the palace shops. People say to me, do I talk to it? And I, I don't. I occasionally curse at it when I'm trying to reach some bit that's out of reach. You know, like, <laughs> but um, I don't talk to it, no. <laughs> Jill's present day crop is giving her a few sleepless nights. I don't like to admit to it, really, because, you know, it's like it's preying on your mind. Um, and it is always, I always dream that people have got in here and I'm having difficulty getting them out. Because I work in here on my own and the door is locked and people look in through the glass, I always dream that there's loads and loads of people wandering about and they say, you know, excuse me, you're not supposed to be in here, would, would you mind? And they won't. You know, and, and as I'm talking politely to one lot of people, another lot come in and, and gradually I'm having difficulty in trying to usher them out. Uh, I don't know what you read into that. But <laughs> well, I think there must be a sort of almost a spiritual connection between the two, a sort of symbiosis. But the, the vine needs the, the vine keeper, and the vine keeper needs the vine. It's a, a, a strange arrangement. But um, I think Jill's a strong enough person and has enough interests elsewhere that um, she wouldn't uh, let it take her over her life. It has occasionally interfered, however. On our wedding day, my husband and I were married in the chapel here and I came round and did the ventilation in the, in the morning and then when everybody had gone home after the reception, I came round and shut it back up again and we had our honeymoon in the autumn after all the grapes were sold and that, of course that's when we have our holiday every year uh, in the autumn. <laughs> There are still two months to go now before the grapes will be sweet enough to harvest. Jill just hopes they'll be good enough to eat.
Bugbuster Bob Child has been called in to rid the Tudor kitchens of some unwanted visitors, sooty moths. He had intended to use a female pheromone to lure the male moths onto traps where they would die in a state of sexual frustration. Well, the good news for them is that Bob couldn't get hold of the right sort of pheromone. The bad news is he's opted for a faster solution, insecticide. It's one of these insecticides um, that uh, upsets the insect's um, metabolism but doesn't affect ours. It's only active on invertebrates and therefore uh, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a nerve poison for them but because they've got such a completely radically different structure from ourselves it uh, uh, has no effect on us. It's particularly designed for historic houses so it has no kind of oily base to it, it doesn't stain, it doesn't smell and by tomorrow morning these areas can be opened up again perfectly safely to the visiting public. To guarantee total extermination, Bob sprays throughout the kitchen, especially the stuffed animals where the moths could lay their eggs. And as for those bread rolls, the source of the infestation, housekeeper Jill has been instructed to put them in the freezer, but only temporarily. They have been sprayed. But we do know that uh, the eggs and the grubs were coming out of here, so to freeze it is one way of absolutely making sure you've killed it stone dead. Oh, good afternoon. So if you have an ambassador visiting you, you've got to entertain him. This is actually a portrait of Elizabeth of Bohemia. It's the height of fashion in about 1540. Guides dressed in historically accurate costumes were introduced into the palace in 1992. The reproduction outfits from the Tudor and Georgian periods were the brainchild of Anne Fletcher, head of interpretation and education. Our thinking at that time was that we ought to really bring to life the past history of the building. Because if you're talking about royal history and how people lived at court, it's a concept that not many people understand. So we thought what we should do is put people back into the rooms, reenacting life of the past, wearing clothes of the past, and really explain the building in that sense. William would have had all his rooms covered in tapestries, and actually he used the same tapestries that had been made for Henry VIII over 150 years beforehand. A good costume guide to us is somebody who, above all, um, is a good community. We deliberately decided that we didn't want people pretending to be a person from the past. So we didn't want people speaking in hey nonny nolly language and pretending to be a Tudor because that would be irritating. We wanted people who could really talk to our visitors and be friendly and approachable. So we look for people who are extremely knowledgeable, are you know, sort of twinkly and bright and look like you can go and ask them anything. The contract to provide the costume guides went to an outside company. Caroline Johnson, one of the 15 guides working at the palace, is also the company's costume manager. Costume does help because it introduces a personal note. The places that we're showing people were, of course, inhabited, and that's one of the most difficult things for people to understand. So the fact that we are dressed as an example of the type of person who might have been here immediately brings into people's minds, oh yes, of course, these rooms were inhabited. One of the most extravagant and lavish ways of doing this was to hold a tournament. Lucy Capito has been on maternity leave for the last seven months and has just returned to work part-time. Her old costume no longer fits properly, so a new one is to be made for her. They needed a new gown anyway, and so they chose me to have it. And it's going to be much grander than the one I had before, which is rather nice. So I'm going to go up the social scale, so um, quite excited about that. The process of making a new and historically accurate Tudor gown is painstaking. Before Lucy's gown can be started, designs must first be submitted to the palace curators for their approval. A costumed guide himself, Matthew Tyler Jones, is the draftsman. When we're making a costume, we have to provide the palace with a sketch of what it's going to look like and samples of the sort of fabric. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm drawing an approximation of what, of what it's going to look like. The problem is my drawing has got to show enough of the structure, how the thing's actually put together, 
to uh, satisfy the curators that we know what we're talking about, essentially. So with that, I work with Caroline, discussing well, exactly how it all goes together, so that that comes across. Well, it's this one. Ah. But I'm very uncertain about how these sleeves work. It comes down to a point there, you right. see. Now, that, that's a structural point, so it's worth putting in. How's it, how's, oh, how's it all meant to hang? What, what happens is that this, this bit here is mm -hmm. happening underneath here as well. Historical accuracy is the absolute be-all and end-all. Right. We're not here in order to be a costume show. We have an absolute imperative duty to be utterly accurate to the best of our knowledge. It's not easy in the Tudor period because there's virtually nothing in the way of archaeological evidence remaining. So we are limited really to the written sources and the pictorial okay. sources. Jewelry, I've just got something in there. Ah, yes. Now there you need to be looking at this one again. Because Let's the idea here. with this... Yeah, we're not trying to recreate a dress that's shown in any one particular portrait, but we're taking elements of gowns from all over and uh, putting them all together into what we hope will provide quite a typical uh, dress from the period. It's, it's been... Um, uh, a textile decoration has been laid on over the velvet. Yeah. The gown will be one of the grandest in the costume guy's repertoire. The wearer would have been a high-ranking noblewoman in 1540, at the time of Henry's last wife, Catherine Parr. We're showing a rather intermediate stage. The way I intend to dress Lucy would have cost her, in those days, 15 to 25 pounds, something around that time. Now, this is in an age when even a knight might have a disposable income of only 50 pounds a year. So you can imagine his wife isn't going to get an outfit worth 15 to 25 pounds. It gives you an idea of how much money people were investing in peacocking in front of everybody else at court. Lucy's come in to have the first fitting of her new dress with historical costumier Nina Michaela. <laughs> this is um, what's known as a toile, the fabric pattern, and it forms the basis of the whole costume. So this is the shape we really have to get right, make sure it fits very snugly and Lucy's comfortable. The typical look of this, kind of early 1540s, is... Um, very square, low neckline, um, very rigid body with no curving bust line. It's, uh, to our eyes, it seems very kind of severe, I suppose. Um, I think the overall look is very feminine. It's a good welcome back to have a brand new frock. Um, and it's always, this is a kind of, you know, again, for us in modern day, a romantic dream to be dressed in old clothes and especially to have a personal fitting. I mean, very few people can wear couture clothes, which is essentially what this is. Um, so coming to work to pair, wear clothes like this is quite an incentive, really. Reproduction costumes should be... You should be able to display them and say, if you bumped into Henry VIII in the street, this is what it would have looked like, and someone could go in and look underneath all the layers and it would be as it was, so that school children or visitors can go up and say, how do you get into that and what's, this, what's it made of and what's it lined with? How do you go to the toilet? All of those things that everyone wants to know but that you can't tell looking at a portrait. It's all about detail. It's just attention to the most minute, boring little things. Costume manager Caroline Johnson has travelled into London in search of suitable material for the main body of the gown. She's keen to use brown silk velvet, a colour and fabric she hasn't used before in the costumes. It's all specially dyed, you know. I don't know whether I should... You know, they are nice cloth things. Oh, yeah. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Wow. That is really beautiful. Yes. Yes, I definitely fancy that one. What's the ground? Is that... The ground is uh, viscose. Right. OK. Well, that's all right, because that's going to give it... a you know, greater strength, yes, but yeah. the, what you're actually looking at and handling, because people do actually come up and stroke us, yes. and they can feel the difference between silk and any other fibre that, that we use. And also, sure. it just, it hangs differently. It's so liquid, yes, isn't it? Yes. I really want this one. This is the one that I think is going to be the best. Right. Um, so that, well, yes, but it isn't my decision, you see. I've got to present samples to the curators. Right. I'm on my way to Joanna Marshner, the assistant curator, 
I'm going to show her the finished proposal and pass over all the research that we've done and the swatches and all the rest of it. And I'm just hoping that she's really going to like it and approve of everything. So really, this is the big moment, fingers crossed. Yes, also at the bottom. What? No, we've got, I noticed here, you've got two browns. Yes, now I, I prefer the darker one. But brown velvet, that's actually very nice, isn't it? I love yes. them, love Yes, them. that's right, yes. Um, it is, it I'm is standing to be, there, so I'm going, yes. in the shop. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is to be cautious, Caroline, of anything that begins that to look a little bit... That could possibly look purple. purple. No, because I am, I am aware of that, You'll have yes, a little bit of explaining it's... out of it to do. Yes. And, of course, some tree legislation actually says that a lady of this stand wouldn't station be, oh no, actually no, wouldn't be wearing that. possibly be wearing so purple. I think what we've got to see is I wonder if we... we but that we doesn't go, we look a... purple at all. No, uh, I don't think the... it does. I think that's probably going to going to serve. No, the colour purple is going to be restricted um, to the Queen... Um, the daughters of the monarch, and a very, very tight circle um, um, of people just underneath that. Um, we then descend down through the reds to then other colours, which everyone can, can wear. Um, we are going to have to be concerned that in choosing a rich brown, that it doesn't become one of those really rather kind of brown purples, which is characteristic of the colour used yes. um, in oh, well, the mid-16th century. Beginning, beginning to look really good. I think we've got something really, okay. you know, going you know, going ahead now. I think you should go buy your fabric straight away before they disappear. Good. Great. <laughs> Thank you. For many of its royal residents, Hampton Court's most thrilling attraction was the chance to hunt. Ironically, those same hunting grounds, now a 750-acre park to the east of the palace, provide a protected home to 300 fallow deer. The deer are direct descendants of the herd introduced by Henry VIII back in the 16th century. Garden and Estates manager Terry Goff, whose home is actually in the park, often casts an affectionate eye over his neighbours. I've lived in this park now for 14 years, um, and it's really like a large back garden. You you feel sort of passionate and possessive about the whole the whole place, and the deer and the wildlife. You can't help but constantly keep looking around and keeping your eye on them because you feel that they are your responsibility. The deer have always been well cared for, but for very different reasons. Henry VIII introduced them partly as a source of food, but primarily to feed his passion for hunting. And Henry wasn't the only monarch obsessed with the sport. James I neglected state business to hunt, his wife Anne was known as the Huntress Queen, and it cost William III his life. He died two weeks after a fall from his horse hunting deer for his dinner. And it was part of the live larder where the king would hunt with um, uh, greyhounds. Part of the park in those days was called the chase, where they would chase deer and hunt deer. Much of the time, Terry has more trouble with the human visitors in Home Park than with his herd of deer. Excuse me. No, no, you can't have barbecues in here, I'm afraid. You can't stop here. I'm sorry, um, this, you, you can walk in the park, but you mustn't bring your car in. And you're going to have to put that out, I'm afraid, in case it catches on the long grass. OK, thank you very much. Barbecue for two. <laughs> Terry's more watchful than usual because it's fawning season. He anticipates that 70 baby deer will be born this year. This park has lots of different zones of grass of different heights. It's important that the deer have cover, particularly at this time of the year when, when the, the females are, are fawning, so they can hide their their youngsters in the long grass. What normally happens is they will give birth, they will hide the fawn, leave the fawn in the long grass, go away, feed and recover. And then they'll come back and find the youngsters, which they do by smell and sound, and they will move them to another location. They'll keep moving the youngsters until they are fast enough to run with the herd. 
These animals have been protected in the park for more than a hundred years, but because they're no longer hunted, Terry has to make difficult decisions. Well, obviously, the deer have no natural predators, and we have 300 deer, they have to be controlled. We must make sure that the herd uh, remains at a manageable size and that there is enough available grazing to support that herd. So culling, although it's unpopular, we don't like doing it, it is a very important part of deer management and we have to do it in order to maintain and conserve the quality of the herd. It's uh, one of the great major conservation successes, I feel, that we're able to display deer in, in this park today and that people can come into this park and can enjoy these, these beautiful, graceful animals feeding and wandering within their natural habitat. Historically, deer were introduced for food. Today, the deer are here as ornaments, really. Wherever you look at Hampton Court, there's water. Gallons of it in lakes, fountains, and of course the passing River Thames. It's played a significant role in the palace's history, according to assistant curator Jonathan Foyle. Water is very important, not only at Hampton Court, but Windsor, Greenwich, Richmond, all those palaces were along the Thames, and it's the means by which the royalty could, could get to the palace, and indeed most of noble visitors would come by water rather than dirt tracks from London. So it was important in that respect. As well, water is important both to, for people's drinking water, for the, for the baths, to provide for the kitchens, and water, of course, helped to clean the palace as well. So it's, it was fundamental that Hampton Court was based on uh, water and the Thames provided everything it needed. Hampton Court boasts a French-inspired artificial lake called Longwater, built by Charles II, and a complex plumbing system built by Cardinal Wolsey. Gallstones and a distrust of Thames water quality forced Wolsey to be inventive. The hill on the horizon is Coombe Hill, just behind Kingston, and it was the original place uh, where Wolsey brought his water down to the palace and he had a, a series of lead pipes all joined together with canvas bound together to serve the, the palace from about four miles away. It served the palace for over 300 years until about 1876, I think, the, the precise date, when during a period of drought and the Thames dropped, a barge going along the river actually um, fouled the lead pipe and snapped it in half. Woolsey's system was ahead of its time, but it had two major drawbacks. The first was that the water kept coming down the hill whether it was wanted or not, so gravity-powered fountains had to be built to take the excess. And the second was the lead water, which turned the cook's vegetables black. Um, I'm, about, sorry, I'm about three feet down under the Henry VIII's kitchens, and about 450 years ago, and, uh, I'd be surrounded by Tudor kitchen waste, rotting vegetable things and um, boiling water and so on being tipped into the kitchens as it made its way down to the Thames. Never been down here before. It's really quite a discovery for me, really. I've got a fairly basic plan of the layout of the culverts, but it's such an such a interesting environment. It must be about a mile and a half or something, a mile and a half, two miles. Henry obviously felt the need for some pretty heavy-duty drainage. He took personal hygiene very seriously and comfort along with it. His toilet, known as the close stool, had richly upholstered seat for the royal bottom. He even had a special attendant known as the groom of the stool to look after the toilet and him while he was using it. Lovely job. Henry must have felt that he had a particular problem with that because by 1540 he built the Great House of Easement, as it was, as it was, as it was called, on the um, south side of the, of the west facade. And that serves both to balance that west, western front and also to provide a 40-strong a um, toilet seating provision. It's a very communal kind of effort, I think, required there. But after Henry had built his great hall and had uh, 600 people a day eating twice, they must have had um, uh, an extra need for loose. The building now houses the chief executive's office and needs much less cleaning than it used to. You would get build-up 
I thought, after a while. And for that reason, I, I understand that a chap called Samson was employed to, um, to clear out the underside of the latrines and was paid partly in rum to, to uh, build himself up for the job. The Thames must have been pretty murky in those days. But from 1871, new regulations prohibited the palace from discharging effluent, making the river a much cleaner place for everyone. Hampton Court was first opened to the public in 1839 by Queen Victoria, and within three years it was attracting more than a quarter of a million visitors. Today it's one of the top ten tourist attractions in the country. For many visitors now, first port of call is the information centre. A ten minute film of Henry VIII's apartment, so all you need to do is go across this courtyard here. Warder Ian Franklin has worked here for 18 months, and on his desk is a rather unusual postcard. It's a fabrication, there's a whole series of these that date back to the sort of Edwardian, early Georgian period. And basically what they did was they went round the palace taking photographs like the Great Hall and the Horn Room and whatever and superimposing these very sad paper cutouts on top of them. And the ghosts that appear, for instance Catherine Howard here, is never known to haunt the Great Hall at all. So that's if you believe in the ghosts. It's quite a funny thing. It's there for the children, really, because one of the first questions we get asked on a quiet day is, where are the ghosts? Hampton Court is said to be one of the most haunted palaces in the country. Ian is fascinated by the ghostly stories, and as an amateur historian, he's decided to record them. But first he needs to make people aware of his project. Well, I'm actually going around the palace putting up little adverts, really, for the ghost project to try and get people actually interested in it and to try and get more reminiscences from people who work at the palace at the moment. A lot of people are being quite responsive, but obviously a lot of people don't want their name attached to it. I think there's still a social stigma against things. When Ian's not at work, he collates his written and recorded evidence at home. I've always been interested in the supernatural but I am a bit of a sceptic. One story he's been told is that of Lady A, who lived in the palace in 1940. Her testimony says, I remember once that I saw Cardinal Wolsey. I was sitting down. I looked up and I saw a figure standing with his elbow resting on the mantelpiece with a really contemplative look on his face before vanishing. And when I think back, I try to remember what made me look up when I was reading. There was no real reason, but I remember that I heard the rustle of silk, like his clothes, and it made me look up, and then I looked up, and he disappeared. All these stories are now floating around. Some are very old, some are quite modern. In a couple of hundred years' time, the modern stories may still be going around, but they'll have been elaborated on. And I hope I'm doing historians in the future a favour by actually taking these down, either at first hand or second hand, or whenever I can. <laughs> Good afternoon. Now that the palace has approved the design and fabrics for costumed guide Lucy's new dress, she's having her final fitting. Historical costumier Ninia Michaela has been cutting and stitching for the last six weeks. I think the costume is going to be absolutely gorgeous and so much of it is just down to the materials. I mean, you could make a sack out of that silk damask and it would look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I think it will. And when it has the brown velvet over the top, I think it's going to look very nice indeed. Mm. It's a lovely period to do. Lucy's going to look like a delicious chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking that. <laughs> Belgian chocolate. <laughs> Historical accuracy is absolutely paramount. If I'd have not been interested in that, I could have gone and had a no worries kind of job working in a theatre or for a film company and not have all the responsibility that I do. But there's very few people doing what I'm doing on a full-time basis. And uh, all those details like getting handmade hook and eyes and uh, linen threads and all of the proper things that we all know are in there and we know they're right is, uh, is very exciting to me. Well, this feels amazing. <laughs> it's really beautifully fitted round here. People always think that having boned bodices is really uncomfortable, but it isn't. If they're fitted, it really supports you, so you feel... Well, it just fits. It's, it's not uncomfortable at all. 
The weight of the skirt's great. Not too heavy. The sound of the skirt. sound of it is fantastic. <laughs> Two weeks later, and every stitch is finally in place. For the first time since the 16th century, the gown of a great Tudor noblewoman is about to grace Hampton Court. It's a special moment for Lucy. So how does it feel? It looks gorgeous. Wow. It feels all right, actually. It's amazing, isn't it? Look at this. Look at the light Gosh. on the velvet. It's so beautiful. It's fantastic. And then the hood? Yes. Now we've got to get the, the headwear on. And that's... And that's, that's called a, a French hood. Well, this style is, yes. Um, and it was the most popular from the 1520s right through the 40s and 50s. So called because it was supposedly invented in France, but um, it was worn in England very widely. The most popular style for a good 20 years. Oh, it's very flattering, isn't it? It's it is. It's lovely. But it's not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to dress it up a bit. Um, right. The Tudors would never wear anything bare like this, so there's quite a lot of jewellery and adornments that goes on. Now, this one is one of my favourites. Isn't that lovely? It was uh, a market stall find, and I got a jeweller to change mm. the jewels on this one. But it's, it's very, very similar to one that um, Catherine Parr is painted wearing, mm. um, and designs by Holbein show these perpetual crosses. Well, how about this? It's stunning, isn't it? It's pretty good, isn't it? There's a train behind here as well. Quite a lot of, is it a lot? Yes. <laughs> and how does it make you feel? Do you feel different? Do you feel noble now? It's pretty special, really, I have to say. <laughs> it's great. I Listen to that I, noise. That yes. Is, you can't help but feel different when you're dressed like this. You look absolutely wonderful. Oh, well, you're flattering me here. <laughs> and uh, you've got about two minutes before. Oh, have I? I better go then. My public awaits. <laughs> that I'm wearing are the sort of thing you would have seen a very grand lady at the court wearing. I'm dressed head to toe in silk, lined throughout with taffeta. So this would be a very, very wealthy lady. Perhaps somebody like Lady Denny. Now, she was married to Sir Anthony Denny, who was perhaps the most important servant of the king. The next most important person is his son and heir. Edward was born in October 1537, 28 years, and in fact three wives, it took to get this son. So you can imagine the excitement. He was carried out of his nursery that used to be in that direction, all the way along this gallery and straight through the two rooms that we just came through, down to the chapel at ground level. You're desperate to get it back into your normal clothes now, though. It's warm, I will say that, but I'm not actually sweating. No, you look cool as a cucumber. Good, good. <laughs> so you're looking forward to the rest of the year? Yes, I hope it doesn't get much hotter than this, but I shall stay in the shade, and some of the men's clothing even heavier than this, so actually I shouldn't complain too much. At least I have a nice cool area here. So your immediate future as Lady Denny is looking good, is it? I hope so. <laughs> she didn't get executed ever, so I think we're doing all right with her. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ghost hunter Ian has had a breakthrough. A current resident of the palace has agreed to recount his ghostly experiences. It's none other than ex-police officer and head of operations Dennis McGuinness, taking a break from his daily rounds. During building work, Dennis and his wife Sylvia had to move temporarily to a different apartment within the palace. The previous tenant of the apartment tended to report poltergeist type happening. Yeah. I was very blasé, but I didn't poo pooed everything. Mm. Sylvia told me she felt uncomfortable. Well, yeah. I, I did feel uncomfortable. I had yeah. this yeah. creepy... Uh, I mean, I always felt that my head was creeping. Mm. I, I was aware that there was definitely something in that room. No doubt about it. But I tended to poo poo it. I mm. really did. But I had a, a different experience not so many weeks ago. I passed the half-open doorway of our then sitting room. Yeah. As I turned, I casually glanced in. I believed I had seen a shape in there. Mm. And went a couple of steps, and I thought, oh, I'll have a look anyway, just to see. Mm -hmm. I went into the room, it was in semi-darkness, and there's obviously nothing there. Mm. Nor did I, did I expect to see anything there. But as I stood ready to turn and go out, 
I felt the hairs on my arms stand on end. Mm. Then I felt the hair of the back of my neck stand on end. Mm. And as I began to go up the stairs, I felt that from behind, there were two padded planks pressing on the sides of my head. Mm. And that's the only way I can describe it. And that feeling, that pressure intensified as I walked gently up the stairs. Mm. The feeling was so intense that I actually thought, for the only time in my five years here, mm -hmm. can I actually live here anymore? Even though they're back in their own apartment now, Dennis still has mysterious experiences. This is the doorway where I um, allegedly see things. <laughs> allegedly to myself, that is. Um, on some occasions I've seen, some of the occasions, a little lady, I believe, in blue. And each time it's a glance, first of all, and a second, on second glance she just goes very quickly into this wallway, this, this doorway, and then the wall behind it. On one occasion, this apparition in blue instead went very serenely and sedately into my hallway. And by the time she got to about here, I was running behind her saying, please stop, come back and speak to me. So very real was that feeling that there was something there. And of course, I got into the middle of my hallway, nothing there, me feeling very stupid, coming back very sheepishly and sitting in my chair again. We live in what was once a, a, an apartment occupied by Catherine of Aragon. And of course, our lovely sitting room was actually used by Catherine as a, her presence chamber, where she met her official guests. Very interestingly, our lady in blue was a member of court here for many years. Her name was Olwyn, spelt O-L-W-Y-N. And um, she was a lady in waiting to Catherine of Ar Aragon. But all that seems fairly mild compared with the tales Ian has heard about the haunted gallery, where for centuries people claim to have heard shrieks and screams. Well, this is the doorway that Catherine Howard is reputed to have knocked on when Henry VIII was actually in this room. And she was, basically she had escaped from her guards and she was trying to communicate with the king, trying to tell him that they were about to take her away, presumably to the tower. And it's supposedly her ghost being dragged away, the ear-piercing shrieks of terror as she was being dragged away from the king, from the, her last chance, perhaps, to communicate with the king before her execution. Henry didn't respond. The phenomenon of ghosts could well be a natural phenomenon that we don't completely understand. But uh, as a historian, it's a great way of opening up the past you talk about ghosts and it energises people. People are interested in talking to you when you talk about something exciting. And that can lead to memories of things that happened here in the past. And it has done. It's given me a lot of extra historical information about the palace, which I wouldn't have had if I hadn't been going around asking questions about the ghosts. of formal gardens here at Hampton Court. They're the most visited gardens in the whole of Britain. More than a million people come to see them every year. The responsibility for keeping the gardens blooming all year round falls to the gardeners. This is held well, isn't it? Yeah, it's really hanging on nice. For Deputy Gardens and Estates Manager Graham Dillamore, regular tours of the gardens are crucial to ensure that standards are kept up. And you won't often find him on inspection duty without his hat and his assistant, Gary Wise. We're standing in the pond garden, uh, so called because it was once a pond, believe it or not. Where I'm standing would have been about six feet of water, and there would have been carp swimming around here. They would have been served up on the breakfast table or dinner table on the, the Tudor king or queen. William and Mary spotted the garden's um, great potential, and their love of flowers, uh, combined with their great collection of plants, thought it would be good to turn it into a flower garden. Yeah. The framework. Yeah, they certainly need sharpening up, don't they? Because you're right, they do look... They look actually, they, do, they look more like turkeys than peacocks. They can be interpreted a number of ways. This is one of the most popular gardens we have, certainly. I think because of the colour, and I think because of its formality, makes it very popular. And it's also got a vantage point. So you see all the colour, you see all the formality. Forty gardeners work full-time to keep the 60 acres of formal gardens up to scratch. Each year, the palace nurseries grow 140,000 bedding plants, including 23,000 wallflowers and 29 different types of geranium. 
The colour schemes that you see here in the garden are um, the schemes that I developed about a year ago. And one of the great satisfactions that I have with my job is to do the colour designing for the floral displays. And it brings me enormous amounts of pleasure to see ideas that were once on paper with a piece of coloured crayon or a pencil suddenly come to life in the form of tulips and pansies. I don't like this, Alison. No, I know you don't. <laughs> you made that obviously clear. Did I? I think it's very raggedy. I like it. It's a nice yellow, nice bright yellow, and it goes well with that tulip. It's all right in a rock garden. I'm not sure it's a bedding plant. Okay, well, you find me another yellow like that, or something else yellow comes okay. into flower that time I of year, and that. I'll have it. It's but I know what you mean. It's yeah. a bit raggedy. It's a bit hanging basket, isn't it? Yes. It's a bit Chelsea flower show, and we don't want that. Either. We're better than that. It's an astonishing fact that 80% of ordinary household dust is actually made up of flakes of skin and other human debris. So the 600,000 or so people who walk in here through the palace front door every year actually constitute a serious problem with dust. It's rather ironic, really, that the very visitors that the palace needs to attract to pay its way actually do pose a serious threat to the priceless artefacts around us. The job of protecting the precious furniture and furnishings falls to the palace housekeepers. We're a small band who work in the palace on the historic areas of the state apartments, the parts that are open to the public. Our job's to care for and protect all the furniture and the furnishings. Half the job, to three, to three quarters of the job, is actually cleaning of various different kinds using specialist techniques. 26-year-old Helen Smith has worked at the palace for three years and is now supervisor of housekeeping. She has a degree in archaeology, and this has proved invaluable for the sort of specialist conservation cleaning her job requires. Well, what I'm doing is dusting these carvings by Greenland Gibbons. They're made of lime wood, and so they're very, very delicate. Um, I'm using a brush made of pony hair, which has got very, very soft bristles. The brush is lifting the dust away from the surface in a flicking action. We're, not, we're trying not to scrub at the surface, we're just lifting the dust away. And the vacuum cleaner acts as a dust pan. The pieces are individually pinned on and some of them are very fragile. This piece is very fragile here. So I have to be careful not to knock any of the pieces while I'm cleaning. I also have to be careful not to use too harsh a brush that will actually wear away the surface. This irreplaceable lime wood carving was created by Grinling Gibbons, the master craftsman of his day. He began working on the carving for the king's apartments in 1699. It forms an overmantel for a painting of Charles I, and it's the most complex example of Gibbons' work at Hampton Court. Because it's so delicate, Helen rarely gets a chance to clean it. This is actually one of my favourite jobs, doing this. It's very rewarding. Because you only come up twice a year, you can really see the dust that you're taking off, and it's just the privilege of being able to work with such beautifully carved objects. The newest recruit to the housekeeping team is Jonathan Trevelyan. He's been at the palace for three months now, and he'll remain an apprentice for the rest of his first year. I think I'm finding my feet, slowly and surely. There's um, very many considerations uh, which would not be immediately obvious. So I'm learning, learn a little extra every day, really. These Georgian stools are gently vacuumed through nylon mesh to protect the vulnerable upholstery. Gloves are worn at all times to prevent acidic sweat touching the objects, and each job is approached with painstaking precision. I suppose it is a bit uh, akin to uh, painting the fourth bridge, but I suppose when members of the general public comment on how spectacular the, the objects are looking. It makes the task seem a little less daunting and that uh, a little appreciation goes a long way, I guess. I can't go into a pub or into a friend's house even without actually seeing dust in places that they wouldn't notice it themselves. I quite like going around other historic houses and sneakily having a look around to see if there are any dust levels there. 
it's probably made me uh, shut my eyes to <laughs> the, uh, the sort of condition of my, my house, actually. It seems it's just too much. A bit like a busman's holiday, really. <laughs> The dust that we get in the palace mostly comes from people. We shed huge amounts of skin all the time, but also you'll bring in bits of soil from outside, pollen. And funnily enough, around different parts of the palace, the dust actually looks a different colour. On the south front, the gravel actually gets billowed up as people walk over it, and that accounts for quite a large amount of the dust on that side of the palace. The ironwork on the king's staircase was created by the great French blacksmith, Jean Tijoux who came to the palace in the late 1600s at the invitation of Christopher Wren. As William III was keen to outdo the glory of the court of Louis XIV, Tijoux modelled his work on that at Versailles. Sometimes it can be a little soul-destroying, and you sometimes feel like you're cleaning a surface which is already clean, but if you didn't dust it, then the very next day it would look absolutely terrible. So in that respect, it can be a little daunting to have to go back and do the same job again, but most of the time it's very satisfying to know that the pace is kept beautifully clean and in good condition and it's not going to suffer any damage through the way that you cleaned it. Henry VIII was Hampton Court's first royal owner. His Lord Chancellor Thomas Wolsey lived here before him, having designed and built the first palace on the site here. Unfortunately for Wolsey, he fell badly out of favour with Henry for having failed to secure a divorce for him from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. So Henry commandeered his much-prized home and set about rebuilding the palace, spending £18 million in today's money, totally eliminating every trace of Wolsey's existence here. Or so he thought. The towering 50-foot-high oriel window of the Great Hall is the kind of architectural feature that interests assistant curator Jonathan Foyle. As the palace's architectural boffin, he knows a good piece of building work when he sees it. But Jonathan noticed something unusual about the window when he first came to work at the palace two years ago. It didn't seem to fit in with the rest of the hall. I was, I was, I was mulling around the, the outside and a couple of things didn't quite add up. You see the way that the um, string course, that's a vertical, um, horizontal rather, band of stone, when it reaches the top of the bay window, it has to dip down. If, if the thing was designed at the same time as the rest of the hall, you'd expect it to be you know, on the same lines, the same kind of design um, running through it. It doesn't make sense at all. Secondarily, the window here meets the wall, not at the top of the arch, it's about a third of the way down the arch that that, that junction happens. That doesn't make sense either. The string course underneath the main windows of the hall with, that we know was built by Henry VIII, when that approaches the bay window, what does it do? It just, it just chickens out, it stops, and it, it can't articulate itself with that. If it's not part of Henry VIII's great hall, then when was it built? And who built it? The history books will tell you it was Henry, but Jonathan is not convinced. He suspects Henry was bending the truth. Henry VIII, of course, wanted to take credit for everything uh, that he did. And so, rather than knocking everything down and rebuilding it entirely, he would, he would just adjust things to suit him. So um, he would take away Cardinal Wolsey's arms, he'd knock them off and replace his own. And he would just modernise and update it. I mean, rather like we do today, if, if you move into a house and we take down the Dunroman sign and put up Mount Pleasant instead or whatever. The original Hampton Court was a magnificent palace, befitting Wolsey's status as the second most important man in England. He wined and dined his many guests in his great hall. The oriel window was, was part of a standard medieval hall. It would light the area where people sat to eat, the most important people in the hall. So they would have this huge, great um, window towering above them, throwing down light on them, and the window would often be full of uh, stained glass or showing at least their arms and their heraldry and symbolism and those other signifiers of status. So the, the oral window was the most important part of the most important room of a medieval house. So it's crucial really to the history of Hampton Court. So if Jonathan's to challenge the accepted history of the window, he's got a lot of work to do. Well, I'm going to meet Robin Sanderson this morning, who's a consultant geologist and we'll be having a look at the oriel window of the Great Hall. 
So if you can tell us where the stone comes from, it goes some way toward answering whether or not it's a Wolsey or Henry VIII uh, building. So it should be very useful. Taking advantage of the scaffolding that's now in place so, for the innovation um, of the Great Hall roof, they can make a close Robin examination. Question, if Robin can identify the stone, Jonathan can check the records to see if it was shipped to Hampton Court in Cardinal Wolsey's time. Robin, which of the stones would you point out as being the Oxfordshire type that you'd well, thought the, of or maybe quite early? Uh, probably the Oxfordshire types are, are these creamy brown ones and the the darker brown mm. there. Uh, the pale material, some is um, uh, bath stone. I, I, I'll stick my neck out and say that these two no, are bath don't, stone. Don't stick your neck out too far, Robin. No. I'll, I'll and um, that looks very much like a Lincolnshire limestone. This would indicate a late um, repair. This pale patch here, oh. at present I feel that this is probably corn stone from Normandy. In which case it might be original. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a jigsaw, isn't it? Yeah, but well, as I said, it's a jigsaw. Yeah. What have I, I... I've suggested about five different types already. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness knows what which we'll will find least, when we go down. At least make for a colourful uh, drawing anyway, I, won't it? I, I pass it over to Jonathan <laughs> for him to decide which is original and which isn't. With so many different types of stone used over the centuries to maintain the window, it's going to be a long and difficult task identifying the original stone, let alone finding a reference to it in the records. Back home, Jonathan's continuing his detective work. He's searching through records of craftsmen who worked on the palace as another line of inquiry in establishing a construction date for the Oriel window. But it is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Do you know, anything you do at Hampton Court is... It's complicated by something or another, really. And the more I read into it, the more I see what a, a, a huge number of people worked at Hampton Court. And um, trying to find a common strand is actually very difficult. Despite the increasing complexities, Jonathan does have one more ace up his sleeve. He's about to investigate Christ Church College in Oxford, which was built by Cardinal Wolsey. It's crucial we go to Oxford because it's Wolsey's other great hall uh, is at Christchurch. Now, we may find some very close relationships between the bay window, if that is Wolsey's building, and Christchurch. So what I'm going to do is have a look for things like the details of the masonry to see whether they're more likely to be Wolsey work than Henry VIII, or whether it proves to be the other way around. At the college, Jonathan has once again called on the help of geologist Robin Sanderson. The stone is entirely different. Uh, the stone for the Hampton Court Oriel is calm stone of the inside, uh, in the sort of position where we are now. Here, it's an oolitic limestone, um, almost certainly from Tainton in the Windrush Valley, which is only a few miles west of here. It suggests, perhaps, that um, this window was carved here in Oxford, whereas the Hampton Court window was carved somewhere in the London area. It's not the answer Jonathan was hoping for. The stonework doesn't provide a link to the palace. But something else has caught his eye. The window um, tracery patterns are virtually identical. The way that the vaulting is set out, it's a sense of deja vu almost, but what we've got here in the centre are Wolsey's coat of arms. This is Hampton Court. And you'll see that we've got these two pendants with two full fans um, and these sections of fans in the corner. Now, if we, if we look up and compare that to what we've got here, we've got a virtually identical arrangement. And it's very exciting because it, it means either that what we've got at Hampton Court is Wolsey Building or Henry VIII's Masons, for whatever reason, whether it's Henry wanting a copy or because the Masons had worked here and were very um, familiar with it, were producing um, a piece of you know, one-upmanship at Hampton Court which would be bigger than Woolsey. So it's either Woolsey or Henry keeping up with the Woolseys, as it were. And outside, there are more links with Hampton Court. At a glance, standing here looking at the, at the bay window, it's, you wouldn't know whether you were at Hampton Court or, or here. It's so similar. 
but on the side, instead of the way the Hampton Court looks quite odd and built up against, this one is very neatly finished off when it, when it comes into the wall. And, um, you know, th this is the kind of thing that makes Hampton Court look like something's been built up to. Uh, and this shows how it should have been finished off very neatly, or how it could have been finished off. And if it wasn't, um, you know, we need to ask ourselves why. <laughs> Jonathan's visit to Oxford is the turning point in his quest. Back at Hampton Court, he realises that the design similarities between the two windows are too great to be ignored, so Henry's claim on the Oriel window is looking decidedly shaky. And there's another set of clues for Jonathan to follow. He now concentrates his efforts on the work of the mason, Redman, who built the vault above the window at Hampton Court, and his partner, Virtue, who built similar vaults at Bath and Westminster. And this information will provide the final piece of his elaborate historical jigsaw. What's unquestionable is the fact that Virtue was master mason at Westminster. And he was so busy, William Birchie this is, so busy that in 1518 he was made joint master mason with Henry Redman, who was the master mason at Hampton Court. So they were partners in trade. In the 1520s, if Henry Redman, responsible for Hampton Court, wanted a fan vault to be built, he could have said to uh, Virtue, well, how do you do it because you're the specialist? He would have said, look at what I've done at Bath, look at what's happened at Westminster, put them together, there you've got your vault. There are two buildings from different parts of Britain. In 1527, Virtue was dead. In 1528, Redmond was dead. They're both dead before Wolsey leaves the palace. So, after those multiple deaths, how would Henry have sourced, or why would he have sourced from buildings so far apart? So, after months of difficult research and exploration, what point has Jonathan reached now? I think we've proved something um, conclusive in my mind, that the oral window is Wolsey's and not Henry VIII's, as, as previously assumed. Well, Jonathan's findings are controversial. They'll stir up a hornet's nest in academic circles. Despite the difficulties, he has managed to prove the historians wrong, and they won't thank him for that. It's really only through acceptance and supposition of the hall being Henry's um, that, that the notion exists at all. So, but the thing is that all of the, all of the accounts up to now have accepted that. So those people who have written beforehand that that's, that's what the state of play is um, may well have something to, to say about why they believe that. Um, but it seems to me to be um, a very ripe area for debate. It will be controversial and I'm glad of that. Yeah. So after nearly 500 years, will Henry VIII finally surrender his claim on the Oriel window? Will Cardinal Wolsey's architectural legacy appear in future history books? Meantime, Jonathan can stand back and take pleasure in his newfound knowledge. It's not every day you get to rewrite history. In 1689, just a few months after coming to the throne, William III and his wife Mary came here to Hampton Court and immediately fell in love with the place. Like any young couple moving to a new home, they made ambitious plans to modernise the place and in fact it's their transformations that we still largely see around us here today. But while it had been love at first sight with the palace, it hadn't been quite like that for the two of them. Mary's marriage to William was not at first uh, the stuff that love stories are made of, but it became so. When she found out she was going to be marrying her first cousin, Prince William of Orange, she apparently burst into tears and cried for a day and a half. The couple spent their first years of marriage in William's homeland, Holland, where they grew to love each other. After more than a decade, they returned to England with grand plans to display their European taste. It took 11 years to modernise Hampton Court to the, the style that they wanted. And because of that, they weren't able to share it together. Mary never saw the work completed. At 32, she died of smallpox. This small room, Queen Mary's closet, was an intimate chamber she used for private interviews, writing letters and conducting business. It also connected the King and Queen's apartments. It became William's memorial to his departed wife. Now it's about to be reopened after three years of restoration work. Oh, you're down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Stop. Yeah. 
Helen Smith and Vicky Richards from housekeeping have just one day to clean up. Dust has accumulated while restorers were studying the room, looking for clues to reconstruct the closet as accurately as possible. Uh, one of the things that, that's um, been found from the evidence is this uh, silk, which is how they think it would have been um, done for Mary. It's hand-woven and hand-dyed. Um, and the colour was found when the archaeologists had a look at the wall. Uh, little tiny, tiny fragments were found behind some nails. Um, and from that, they were actually able to come up with the silk for the wall, which I think is quite amazing. The silk was the backdrop for a set of embroideries. They hung in Queen Mary's closet for 200 years, and it was rumoured they were the work of the Queen herself. However, she shouldn't be the one taking the credit, as assistant curator Joanna Marshaner discovered during the restoration project. They were the work of French Huguenot craftspeople um, who um, were perhaps leading European design um, at this time. The embroideries were removed from the palace by Queen Victoria and taken to Holyrood House in Edinburgh, and this will be the first time they've been displayed at Hampton Court for nearly a century. They were influenced by the style of Mary's interior designer, Frenchman Daniel Marot. I think it's wonderful that they're back. It's going to create a wonderful little jewel of a room um, and, and perhaps get back that sort of, you know, the bright enthusiasm, the love of interior design, the love of designing gardens and homemaking that's very much part of Queen Mary II. Of all of them, I think perhaps this one is my favourite. As a bottom ornament just here, there is a blue and white ceramic pot and it's important to know that one of Mary II's other great enthusiasms um, and interests was the collecting of Oriental um, porcelain. Pieces from Mary's treasured collection are being chosen to feature in the closet under the guidance of the head of works of art, Sebastian Edwards. Mary wasn't the first person to make them popular, but I think the sheer scale of her collection and the originality with which she displayed it and the fact that it was very visible at court meant that she was an enormous influence on the taste for um, English aristocrats for the next two centuries. And the legacy of their collecting can be seen in any country house today. I've come right round this side. Carefully handing over the Chinese-style okay. porcelain is Joe Cowell, superintendent of the Royal Collection. These belong in Queen Mary's closet, actually, and they were only brought through here uh, as a temporary measure for when we, uh, we housed Queen Mary's closet. And then we will find other porcelain to go in this area. The Privy Garden today is an exact recreation of William and Mary's private gardens, which were designed and planted between 1689 and 1702. Every hedge, every tree is clipped absolutely to historically accurate specifications. But as summer approaches, high season, there's one vital ingredient missing, a touch of the exotic. This morning we're bringing out uh, for the summer season a collection of orange trees which form part of the larger exotic collection that we have here at Hampton Court Palace. 20 trees that have been put into position in the garden. They've spent the winter in the warmth of the palace greenhouses under the watchful eye of the nursery manager, Tony Boulding. This is a recreation of a collection of tender plants that were gathered at Hampton Court by Queen Mary in the late 17th century. They are frost tender, so we need to wait until the chances of frost has gone before we can really bring them out into the gardens. This is the, uh, the bitter orange, Citrus orantium, which was uh, usually used for making marmalade. And they're quite a vigorous tree, hence all this nice lush growth that you can see on it now. Tony's boss, Terry Goff, has a keen interest in 17th century garden history. Oranges were very special at Hampton Court because William III was the Prince of Orange and they represented the House of Orange dynasty. And in England at the time, they had the largest collection of oranges anywhere. So it was this very special and significant plant. The plants will be staged out in precise positions within the garden uh, as they were in the 17th century and they form part of the overall sort of form and shape of the garden. They add a bit of architectural 
lift to the garden. They're shaped trees in white tubs and with the bright sunshine and the green grass the white tubs reflect light and uh, look very attractive. And the 17th century garden was about man demonstrating his power over nature by design. So everything was contrived to look artificial and man-made. And collecting plants from all over the world was, was a, a symbol of power. The exotics really were the icing on the cake. They represented the real ornate finishes to what is a, a very formal decorative design of garden. We're a little bit blasé these days because oranges now are commonplace. You can buy them in most shops and supermarkets. Um, they're not as special as they were in the 17th century. Those trees which can be are positioned by tractor. However, modern machinery isn't always enough. The trees are very large and difficult to manoeuvre so they will have to be manually lifted by eight people, much as they were in the 17th century, using the same style of lifting with a number of poles and pure manpower and coordination to get them into the, their final positions for the summertime. Their winter home in the palace greenhouses is a cool and airy one. Despite their exotic origins, orange trees don't like to get hot and humid. Tony and his team know that the trees thrive best when they're allowed to dry out between waterings. But now it's time for a good drink. There's a little bit of uh, insect damage on them. There's one or two bits of dieback which we'd normally expect after the winter period. But uh, once pruned up and uh, enjoying the sunshine, they'll, they'll soon uh, get over that. We find that the birds and beneficial insects that are around in the gardens help to clean them up as well. We don't really suffer from aphid problem once they're out in the garden. Everything in this garden is a 17th century plant. There is a one single plant in this garden that would not have been used in the 17th century. So people coming through that gate get the feel of coming back 300 years in time. And that's precisely the way it should be. The restoration of Queen Mary's closet is nearly complete. Joe Cowell and the palace curators need one last work of art to hang above the fireplace. They've chosen a work from the studio of Titian, the renowned Venetian artist. It's been many years since the picture, known as the Allegory of Duke Davalos, was last on display at the palace. This is, um, as well you can see on the label at the bottom, it's after Titian, so that meant really that there's probably two or three different hands on the painting, so not strictly speaking by Titian alone but a very, very fine representation of Titian's work. So it obviously had great influence during the composition of the painting. We are very, very pleased, of course, to get it out of um, limbo land, if you like, and back into the State Apartments. As the housekeepers finish their cleaning, it's time to bring in the furnishings. After three years of conservation work, finally the restoration of William's tribute to Mary is complete. One last romantic detail, though, comes from the end of William's own life in 1702. When his body was embalmed, ready for burial, his doctor found that he wore around his neck a locket which contained a tress of Mary's hair. 
which I think is a, a poignant little detail to the, the romantic story of William and Mary. And Hampton Court, of course, stands today as a tribute to them, with the Queen's Closet being the only room that we can specifically link with Mary herself. last. Nice to have the room back to how it should be after, well, nearly three years when it's been closed. Um, and everything's just about done now, so I think we can let the public in. In the 18th century, George III decided not to live in the palace, but to give the vacant rooms rent-free to loyal subjects. This grace and favour practice is being phased out by the Queen now, but it leaves Hampton Court with a problem. In this commercial world, the palace must find a lucrative use for these apartments. They may even go up for rent. The decision lies with the Director of Palaces, Robin Evans. We have quite a large number of vacant apartments in the palace now. About 25% of the palace will be vacant by the year 2000. So we're looking at new ways to occupy those. They're not suitable for the visitor because they're on the second and third floors. They're quite small rooms. They were courtiers' rooms originally. They've been grace and favour apartments. They're not state apartments. Uh, we don't need them. So we're going to try and find us an outside uh, occupier. Being a royal estate agent isn't an easy task. The curatorial staff, including assistant Jonathan Foyle, must put together reports detailing which important historical features need to be preserved. God, it's quite tough, though. It's a long way up, isn't it? Yeah, it is a long way up, yeah, and it makes you wonder how some of these residents have coped in the past. Yeah. What are those baskets for? Well, these are the only way that people could really do any shopping. They could winch the basket down about 40 feet, and then um, the person would take the shopping list off and um, come back, bring their shopping and um, put it back and you'd have to haul the whole lot up again. Brilliant idea. Until you have a dinner party for 20. Uh, yes. And then you're really in trouble. It's just magnificent. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it, to have a view like that ready for you. And who needs paintings? <laughs> who would have had this room? Um, there were, on this area, above the King's rooms, there were people like um, <clears throat> the um, King's personal attendants and grooms of the bedchamber, that kind of thing, and um, a couple of um, oddly titled Necessary Women. Necessary Women were in fact ladies-in-waiting, but they weren't the only occupants of the apartments. Many were widows or relatives of state officials. The Duke of Wellington's mother lived here in the 19th century, and he fondly named this alcove Purr Corner, after the gossiping old ladies whose dulcet tones he thought resembled the purring of cats. More modern grace and favour residents included Mrs Hannah Scott, mother of Scott of the Antarctic, and Lady Baden-Powell, whose husband Robert founded the scouting movement. Beautiful, isn't it? Wonderful piece of craftsmanship. I think this one's about George I period, um, and it may well have come from the Queen's apartments, because some of these um, knobs look like Queen's crowns and others King's. Hampton Court's grace and favour apartments were once sought after homes. Even famous dictionary writer Dr Johnson was refused accommodation here. But in 1986, they gained attention for a very different reason, as the seat of the fire, which caused so much devastation to the palace. Most of this panelling is original. You can see where modern boarding has been um, inserted between these. You can see also uh, some of the scorch damage, where the fire has crept up the walls. Here, where this paint's peeled off, you can see the remains of um, fake oak graining. Someone has painted the oak on with a brush to oh, disguise the fact that this is pine panelling. It's a cheaper wood which <laughs> so made it look like oak. So that's what, 60s or 70s? The fake oak graining is um, about 1700. Really? Yeah. So nothing much has changed really, has it? Hardly anything at all, really. It seems tragic that they're empty. What sort of people would be suitable residents, do you think? Would there be strong, lots of regulations? Um, there, there'd have to be certain conditions, really. I um, mean, it, it's very extraordinary. <laughs> thing to live in a, in a palace where, you know, what would you do if you had a bicycle, for example, and, or, or you wanted satellite television, I mean, <laughs> there are just everyday things like that which um, you couldn't just you know, go and do. I mean, even things like um, 
you know, what, you're putting pot plants in the window or something, things that anybody would have a right to do you know, in, their own, in their own house would have to be very carefully monitored here to make sure that it didn't sort of wreck the appearance of the building. Yeah, I'd be able to put mm. pictures up on the walls, would I? Um, that's another thing. I mean, just nailing into some of these walls um, really wouldn't be feasible. And some of the timber in these walls, if you bang nails into it, you know, it can start to split because it's dried out over the years and you could be damaging the structures. Jonathan and I are approaching it from slightly different directions. I mean, again, he's there to try and ensure that that, those apartments are passed on in no worse and hopefully a little better condition than we've inherited them, and I absolutely understand that. Of course, my view is that you can't let a, an apartment and tell someone you can't put a picture up. I mean, it's just not real. I think that there are concerns about how do you make sure their baths don't overflow. I mean, it's a real concern because down below you've got a wonderful state apartment. This isn't just a block of flats in Mayfair. It's 500 years this place has been here. Getting the right solution is what's important, not getting a solution. From the sublime to the ridiculous, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, indeed. From the ancient to the modern as well. Classic 70s kitchen. The last proportion of the palace is empty now, isn't it? It is. Yes, it is. Yeah, there are only about four um, residents left. And the palace used to be full of them in the Victorian mm. period. And it would be rather a shame to treat the building entirely as a museum. Mm. And um, to, you know, to present it as in fixed points of history. I think we've got to have some, we've got to have some lungs of the building to keep it breathing and living in, in, in the way that it always has done. Uh, other members of the so it's an ideal des res uh, for somebody with no pets, no bicycle, no pictures <laughs> dying on their walls, and quite a lot of money. And probably a huge amount of money, I should <laughs> think. Yes, it would be. I think it'd be marvellous. I don't know, I think it might be beyond me in price. They're so fire conscious after the fire that they would stipulate that you couldn't do this and couldn't do that and they'd have fire alarms blaring about if they burnt a bit of toast and I don't think a lot of people would be very keen on that, you know. Wonderful. As long as you don't actually want to barbecue on the lawn, yeah. <laughs> be fine. Yeah, put me down. <laughs> Roll over. Housekeepers must be prepared for the most bizarre encounters. I'm just about to enter the haunted gallery area. Over. Yes, received. Thank you. Jill Taylor, a housekeeper for just four months, will this morning come face to face with her most unusual task yet. She's about to meet the biggest bore in the palace, a challenge requiring strategic planning and specialist equipment. Right, OK, so I've got my brushes. I've got the wax, uh, cotton wool, cotton buds for the eyes, brushes, Neela. Uh, right, I'd better get something from the chemical cupboard. When I first started here, I was asked, uh, are you going to mind cleaning a dead animal? And I said, oh, no, 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 just no bother. Um, but now I'm coming to it, it'll be interesting. Jill's mission to spring clean Boris, a stuffed boar who has pride of place in the Tudor slaughterhouse. As it's her first encounter with Boris, she's enlisted the help of Vicky, a fellow housekeeper. The thing is, is to hoover him over just to get the dust off and clean his eyes out, oh poor love, with um, deionised water and Simpronic. Oh gosh, what a job to do. Didn't think I'd ever end up doing a job like this. And Still. The teeth? Yeah, I suppose we could wipe over his teeth, couldn't we? Yes. What do you think about his nose? I think we perhaps might like to do a test on his nose okay. using some Simpronic. One of our main problems is actually going to turn him because yes. he's a big lad, old Boris, isn't he? One, two, three, up! Oh, goodness. Right, just leave it there a minute. Yeah. Here we go, Boris. Excuse me, Boris. After the dust is removed from his coat, Boris's less hairy surfaces must be shined with a special conservation wax, which also protects him against moisture damage. If he's well looked after, Boris could last forever. 
a mild detergent called Supronic is used with specially purified water to deal with his more delicate areas. I feel like I'm in the operating theatre. He's actually really got nice shiny eyes. I'm quite impressed. What about those eyelashes, eh? Hey? Aren't they wonderful? Eyelashes to die for. Oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> When he wasn't bowling, Henry VIII hunted extensively for sport and food. The Tudor royals ate a huge amount of meat. It formed up to 80% of their diet. And the hunting of boar, like Boris, depicted throughout the palace, was an integral part of royal life. It was both hunting and the loss of woodland during the 17th century, which led to the boar's extinction. With no boars left in British woods, Boris's origins are a bit of a mystery. Apparently, he arrived just six years ago when the Tudor kitchens were being revamped. Only one man knows the secret of Boris's past, David Beaton, Chief Executive of Royal Palaces. So, David, where did Boris come from? Oh, that's a fascinating story because we were representing the Tudor kitchens. It's the first thing we did when we started in the palace, and I was absolutely determined that everything would be authentic. So we had to have a real wild boar. And we found that the Queen of Holland had one of the few remaining herd of wild boar in Europe. So we phoned up and actually spoke to the Queen of Holland herself, who said, yes, I'll send out my gamekeeper to shoot one, uh, which is uh, what she did, phoned back a week later and said, it's ready for you. And that was when our troubles began, because we found out rather late in the day that you can't bring back the dead carcass of a wild animal into this country. Boris could only be legally imported if he was properly preserved, and organising that proved to be a bit of a bore. We tried to find a suitable taxidermist in Holland. We couldn't find one, not one that we felt would be able to do the job. So we had to get it over the border to Germany, where there are a lot of very skilled taxidermists. So we had to smuggle it over the border to Germany, where we got a taxidermist to do it. And they did a marvellous job on it, as you can see. And once he was well and truly stuffed, Boris could travel to England to take his place in the palace. So it sits there, and every time I walk through the kitchens, that story sort of comes flashing back to me. Dear old Boris. So Hampton Court was involved in smuggling? Well, perhaps I shouldn't call it that, but uh, I was determined we were going to have a wild boar. Oh, he's lovely. He is, awesome. I think each day now I should come and just check on Boris and make sure he's OK. The gardens of Hampton Court play a vital role in attracting visitors to the palace. And it means the pressure's constantly on the gardeners to keep them looking their best. Every season, that's four times a year, 100,000 plants have to be dug up and replaced with new displays. The pond garden originally was one of the pools supplying the court of Henry VIII with fresh fish. Now it's the jewel in the crown of the palace gardens. Every year, the beds have to be meticulously designed and colour coordinated. And that's all down to the creative skills of Deputy Gardens and Estate Manager, Graham Dillamore. The pond garden is a great canvas to work on, and I certainly use it as a place where I can let my imagination run right and really experiment with colours. It is a little bit rigid in the fact that it's, the, it's very square, the beds are very square, um, so there's not a lot of flexibility with the, the width or the size of the beds. Most people envisage it as being planted in straight lines, and that doesn't have to be the case. The, the flower bed may be square, but the actual bedding design doesn't have to be square at all. You can use circles, triangles, and curves. You can use any kind of shape you like, as long as it fits in with the design. The plants needed for Graham's design have been grown by nursery manager Tony Boulding. Well, that's a nice geranium, isn't it? Is that the sub for that Nicotiana? Yes, it's one called Venus. I haven't grown it before, but it's, uh, I think it'll do the job. Mm. Huh? It's a nice soft pick, but it, it, needs, it needs something stronger with it, doesn't it? Well, it will be. It'll have that white impatience with it, so yeah, uh, it give should it a, lift, uh, yeah. make the difference. And these are Pond Garden top? Uh, top layer. Top C. Century Violet. Yeah. Say. Perfect. They're lovely. They're just right now, aren't they? They're ready oh, to go. Oh, nice. They're, they're a lovely thing. This the inspiration for this year's Pond Garden comes from certainly making the beds a lot longer and a lot broader, and to get, and to get as much out of the colour in the garden as possible by using fewer colours. I'm a little bit worried about these streptocellums. I don't know whether they're going to make it, Tony. No, I think um, 
I misunderstood what you really wanted in that area. If you know it's not giving me enough orange, which no, is what I wanted. No, we might be able to work on it in the time we have left, but uh, I'm a little bit doubtful. OK. Feed these to death, see if we can get them going a bit. In here, there's um, one plant I've had a few problems with. Right. I know it's one of your favourites. Oh, Cesar. Yeah, Czar. It's Czar. I know it's a nice thing, but um, he's a bit shy on rooting cuttings for us. We didn't really start early enough last summer to get these the mm. quantity that we require. Okay. So we're going to have to substitute a yellow marigold for this in the pond garden. We're all right numbers-wise for this on the east front, mm. but not in the not in the pond garden. Okay. Too late. Can't swap it back the other way, can we? I suppose we could do. It depends where we think we'll get the most impact. Mm. Um, I'm quite keen to keep this in the pond garden because yeah, I wanted this foliage. You wanted the foliage effect. For me, the Victorians really knew how to use bedding. They would be quite bold and extravagant with their use of colour. And quite rightly so, because it was a royal palace uh, and they really wanted to make a statement. And, and uh, I backed them all the way. Thank good for the Victorians. I just want to show these curves now, Andy. Just I know we've done them before, I just want to go over it again. Unfortunately, the replanting of Graham's beloved pond garden coincides with his annual holiday. So he wants to be sure that Andy, who will supervise the planting operation, understands the design. These are front for the bend in the snake. And really, I would say about two, if, if that's geranium, so you want to come at least something like that. When you first look at the plan, it looks quite straightforward and Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> but then, um, from past experience, it can go wrong. Although the design shows where the plants have got to go, Andy needs to know how they're going to be displayed, how close, how far apart. Is that... Yeah, that should be OK. But the beds always give Graham a headache. <laughs> Years we've been bloody trying to get this right. And every year, we make it right pig's ear of it, don't we? So this year, we're going to get it right. Aren't we, Andy? I always get it right, uh, Graham. Well, it's, I know, uh, yes, it's always my fault. Exactly, yeah. Perhaps this year. I just, I just copied the plan. <laughs> now, we can either use these abutilons, which are nice, and they've still got that orange feel about them, that orange look. All the that streptocinnamon, but I'm not keen on that streptocinnamon on, uh, on its own. I just think it looks a bit weak. I quite like these. Do you? Unless you use both and you sort of trim, you can trim these down a little bit. And get, the, get the height with the albutyl on, yeah? yeah? And maybe you can keep these down to a lower level and you get a better um, progression upwards. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea, actually. If we use these as a kind of centre, a real, real sort of peak of the mountain kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah? Look. Almost like that, Andy. Yeah, and then those ones there. Almost a pyramid. So we've got a a real orange sensation. We've been tangoed. I like to work with a colour theme. Now and again, not all the time. And, and this bed is, a, is an orange theme, which is something I've not done before. All the plants are a shade of orange, which sort of gives this complementary, if you like, mountain or kind of profusion of colour. And it, it wants to be as gentle as it possibly can. It's no good going up and then jumping up to four or five feet. It, it must come up from the outside nice and gently and then reach into this kind of pinnacle of the abutilons, which is a lovely orange cup. I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work. If Andy pl plants it properly, which will make a change, then I think we'll be all right. <laughs> I had to get that in. No, he always yeah. plants it properly. Most of the time. He's a designer, I think. <laughs> I can only work with the tools that I've got. It's not my fault. <laughs> so now Graham can go away, leaving Andy and his team of eight gardeners in charge of the planting. It's vital the pond garden is back to its best as soon as possible because this is an area which the public pay to see. There is urgency because we want to get them in. And at the same time, we've got to maintain the other areas. I haven't given up for hope of uh, getting it uh, ready when Graham comes back, but uh, it's going to be close. The palace's south elevation was designed by Sir Christopher Wren for William and Mary and was completed in 1702. 
is considered to be one of Wren's finest achievements, but it now needs £400,000 worth of repairs, which are expected to take nearly a year. In charge of the restoration is curator Edward Impey. He's a real fan of the south facade. You can look at it for a long time and from different distances, and it will be, always be equally satisfying. The masses are just right, the proportions of the windows, their height, their width relative to the facade, the neat but decorated but not overemphasized central part in stone in the middle. It just works very well. We've restored the inside of the building to an appearance it might have had at that date, the garden outside likewise. And there are one or two things that remain to be done, if that logic is to be taken to its ultimate conclusion, to the facade of the building itself. As well as cleaning the facade, they'll be repairing the cracked stonework and painting 94 windows. But as always at Hampton Court, the demands of conservation cause complications. It's quite a tricky job because we can't touch the face of the building except in some very small places. So we, we have to make it a very wide and very sort of strong structure. And this is very time consuming, obviously, but it's the way it's got to be done because of the history of the building. And it has to be protected. The palace's desire for historical accuracy has hit a snag. Nobody knows what colour Wren originally painted his windows, and some architectural detective work is going to be needed. We don't know exactly what colour they were, but we know that they weren't white as they are now. We know that they would have been a slightly darker tone. So from the point of view of accuracy, we must be as accurate as we can be within the limits of what we know. Now, but the other reason is it's simply an aesthetic one. If we leave the windows white, we are not being true to what was in the mind of the designer. If we put them back to a colour which he would have accepted, then we're being true to Wren's vision of his building. And therefore, we have to trust Wren, it works better as a facade, as a structure. The first clues that may help solve the mystery come from the nearby barracks block. It was built at the same time as the south facade and could provide some original paint samples. Assistant curator Jonathan Foyle investigates. If I give you a flake, you can... You're damaging the monument. Oh, indeed, it's eminently reparable. But they see the same yellow, um, yellow grey stock bricks. They'll put that under a microscope and um, have a look for things like lead paint, which, which would indicate a pre um, 20th century date, and things like zinc and titanium, which are more modern. And then they'll give us a reference for each of the layers of colour so we can have a good idea of when the paint was applied and what its original colour was, even though it's faded. You have to avoid, um, in a way, choosing a colour that you would personally approve of. If the historical information um, isn't quite what you like then in a way it's tough because you're really trying to give a flavour of the buildings as the architects and the patrons saw them at that time. A team of English heritage inspectors has turned up to judge the body of evidence assembled by Jonathan. We found a fairly early window that showed us 36 schemes of paint. Now when we received the report, uh, they provide us with photographs and uh, a diagram of the, of the paint layers. Most of those are, are off-white or, or cream, and it, it shows us quite a good uh, range and quite, um, quite a clear uh, series of paint layers. Unfortunately, despite all Jonathan's efforts, the paint analysis cannot go far enough back in the building's history. So based on known paint compositions of the 18th century, a sample colour has been painted on one of the windows. So which one are we looking at? It's this window, and you can see that it's, um, it's been half painted. The sample area extends to there, and is the, um, is the creamier colour. This is generated from a consultant's knowledge of, of the way that paint was mixed with linseed oil and, 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 uh, and lead white. And, but it's not specifically matching any of the colours that you found in the paint sampling? No, it isn't, because the earliest we've got um, that we can really put some kind of a date on uh, are probably early to mid-19th century on this, mm, on this elevation. A decision is reached and work gets underway. But not everyone appreciates the detailed detective work that's been involved in recreating Wren's decorative vision. This is Heritage White. It is actually just Dulux. I don't know why they've gone through colour. I think it's a case of it's a heritage building and they've gone through the colour charts. You've probably seen heritage what? And they've just decided to go with that. I think it's more of a magnolia, but it's just a posh way of selling the Dulux.
Andy and his team have only had a week to replant the pond garden with its summer beds and he's worried that the two front beds aren't even. We've got slightly taller ones on that bed on one side. So what yes. I think if you find some more compact ones and just swap them over. So got higher tall, there. That side. You can find a little bit more squat on them. They've just got where they got drawn up in yes. the nursery. Today, their boss, Graham, who designed the garden, is back from his holiday. I'm just trying to make sure that they match up in the way the spacing of the plants from each group, from this side on the other side, really. So when you're looking from inside the garden, they look uh, identical. Mm. Graham is back and eager to see Andy's handiwork. It's all right, isn't it? Let's come on. Ooh! Oh, he's done that well. Well, this is this was experimental. We've not ever done anything like this before. Um, well, I've never done anything with an orange theme anyway. Uh, and certainly two or three of the plants I've never even used in bedding before. So I'll be very interested to watch this progress over the summer. So far, so good. But lack of supplies forced Andy to substitute a plant not on Graham's design. That's not, something's not right. That's not right down the bottom there. That grey shouldn't be grey, it should be um, kind of a variegated chlorophyte, like the spider plants, you know. Because that's the only grey in the garden, and it just sticks out a bit like a sore thumb. It just draws you down there straight away, and it's wrong. So we'll have to get that changed. So we'll have to see if we can find and bend Tony's ear and twist his arm and tread on him a bit, see if we can get some chlorophyte off him. <laughs> but Graham's very impressed with Andy's hard work. I don't think he's ever done this in a week. So I think he's, uh, he's probably, probably broke his own record. I thought he was looking a bit miserable and tired this morning. <laughs> it's a bit nerve-wracking, because um, it could really look awful. And you've got a, you know, got a reputation just to, to stand by that uh, this garden's quite well known. It's a real postcard garden. And uh, make a mess of it, and it really will be seen. But... I don't think we've done this year. It'd be nice to think that um, you're leaving your mark on the place and perhaps in 150 years' time they'll be able to look back and say, oh, the bedding in the 1990s was, um, was really awful. <laughs> well, it was really good. And, ah, uh, oh, that was Dillamore who did that, who knew nothing about colour. <laughs> The Chapel Royal's historic organ was installed in the early 1700s for Queen Anne. It's one of the finest examples of its type. Due to temperature and humidity changes in the chapel, it has to be tuned every six to eight weeks. Chris Trafford and Colin Jilks arrived to tune the chapel's organ. Between them, they have more than 75 years' experience. They tune organs great and small from St Paul's Cathedral to the humblest parish church. All organs are special, and this is a very special one to me because of its age, of its history, and its wonderful building and setting. Right, let's see what to be left for us today. That's not too bad. Let's just try the pitches and see if we're in tune. So. So that's not... That's not too bad, because the heating's been on now since uh, we were last here. Yes, that's right. So uh, that's fine. It's probably the oldest organ that I look after. It was built in 1710 by Christopher Schreider. It's almost 300 years old. Th th these pipes we're, we're hearing today, they were played by Jeremiah Clark, the chap who wrote the trumpet voluntary that most people would know. Um, Handel, George Frederick Handel, was master of the king's music at a time when this organ was was installed and he probably came here and played it and he would have heard these very same pipes there are very few people that can come along and sit at an organ and play it and listen to the very same pipes that that Handel will have heard 
it's a wonderful experience really and to come here regularly and to be able to hear an organ like this it's, uh, my life would be a lot poorer without it <laughs> pipes that you see at the front do speak. They are in fact the diapason pipes, but behind are all the ones that, are, that make up the choruses. In fact, there are 2,202 pipes in this organ. With so many pipes to get pitch perfect, Colin has a busy few hours ahead of him. He needs peace and quiet, so he often works during the evening when all the visitors have gone home. Right. All right, Christopher. Yes, okay. um, I'm on the choir organ, so can we start with the great principle and the choir principle, two middle C's. <laughs> Organs are very cramped and difficult places to work. Right, treble C great, middle C choir. One must all be very careful not to knock a pipe when we're moving amongst the pipes. Just a brush will move one of these little tuning slides out of position and that note will be out of tune. Now just by taking that pipe out of its hole will put it out of tune. The heat of my hand, the warmth of my hand will sharpen it by at least a quarter of a semitone and it will have to be stood back in its rack board, this hole there, which keeps it standing upright and it will have to be left to cool for about half an hour before it can be properly tuned. Next. Back one. These are reed knives. They're constructed with little hook bits on the ends. The pipes have silver bands at the top and they're the tuning slides and can be moved down or up very, very slightly. To, to lengthen or shorten the pipe. So that is what all I'm doing. I'm making the pipe slightly longer or slightly shorter, depending on whether it's sharp or flat. I finish when I think it's right, when the organ's right not just depending on the time. Most people look at the clock if they're working in an office or a factory, waiting for the hours to move. But for me, I look at the clock and the time is gone. I, I find I can be here for six or seven hours and where that time goes, I don't know. Her Majesty the Queen has kept me working in this lovely chapel and some of her other royal chapels as well. I'm a very fortunate person. The organ's now tuned and they can head for home. But Colin and Chris will be back in six weeks' time to start the job all over again. The original owner of the palace was Cardinal Woolsey, who was an avid collector of tapestries. They hung in all the public and many of the private chambers. In fact, in one month alone, in 1522, he purchased no fewer than 132 of them. There was a whole division of the household staff given over to their maintenance, and there's still a department like that here at the palace today. It's called the Textile Conservation Studio. The studio may not be what you expect. It's in a nursery greenhouse, as conservation work requires lots of space. A tapestry from the Royal Collection at Windsor Castle has just arrived. The conservators must inspect and assess the condition of this priceless 18th century French work of art. Right, Van Drift, Jenny and I lift. Can you take away the dust yeah. sheet? And the straps. Move it down a little bit. Up to me. That's fine. Okay. We... Are we going to unroll it that way? Um, what I'd like to do is um, just, if you come around the side and just hold it by the edge, and just get the leading edge down, then Vanda can hang on to that. Mm -hmm. If you hung on to the tapestry there, oh. then I'll have to unroll it from this side. So lift and turn. 
The tapestry depicts a scene from Greek mythology in which hero Meliaga hunts down a wild boar. It was presented to Queen Victoria in 1844 by King Louis-Philippe of France. This is the first opportunity for head of tapestry conservation Lindsay Shepherd to cast her expert eye over it. I was warned that this was um, very dirty and needed cleaning and um, it is very dirty. It's really stiff to the touch. Oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. And it smells horrible. <laughs> mm. Yes, it smells of soot and um, smoky deposits which will mean that the tapestry is probably quite acidic at this level of um, soiling. It's had some really strange repairs done to it. You see all those tiny patches that have been put on there? Look. Oh, eek! They've just been placed on top of one another, quite randomly. They're very dense though, aren't they? Going very, to some you can see them here. Yeah. Well, I don't know that we will take them out. I think that it will disrupt the, the structure so much that I think it, it we'd, we would be left with almost nothing in these areas. Can I just turn it back? Paul Vander's got to do the condition report on this. Every time a tapestry comes into uh, the premises, we have to assess it and find out what's wrong with it. I have to write everything down. I've got to talk about silk degradation. I've got to talk about how the wool is. I've got to see if there's any holes or anything wrong with the tapestry. And I've got to see everything now. If I see something later on while it's on the loom and I haven't costed for it, then the studio loses money. And so, and it's a lot of money. Once the client has accepted a quote, the studio has to do the work for the agreed price. The repairs they do can cost from a few hundred pounds to tens of thousands. And this one isn't going to be cheap. A price agreed for the work, their main objective is to clean the tapestry. Studio technician Julia Everett starts by gently vacuuming the back of it to remove any surface debris. We surface clean it through a, a mesh so as we're not actually making contact with the tapestry itself. She vacuums in straight lines along the vertical and horizontal weave of the delicate tapestry, known as the warp and the weft. I'm going with the weft at the moment and you can go warp ways as well but obviously you wouldn't go diagonally or just you know any old angle because it would uh, damage the fibres even more. With 14 square metres to cover it will take Julia half a day to vacuum the tapestry's surface and that's just the very first stage of the cleaning process. Final crucial tests are needed before the tapestry can be washed to discover if the dyes will run. I'm going to take a sample of almost every colour I can on the tapestry to test for wet fastness. The tapestry is divided into sections so that Julia knows exactly where the threads have come from. Each thread is covered in cotton wool soaked in a detergent and water solution. It's the only safe way to test whether the tapestry can be wet cleaned and what intensity of detergent it can tolerate. I'll leave these overnight and cover them with plastic and come back tomorrow morning and have a look to see if any have run or are fugitive, as we say. We're not sure that this tapestry has ever been wet cleaned before. So this will be its, possibly its first time that it's been completely submerged and washed. In a quiet corner on the south front lives the palace's oldest resident, the 230-year-old Great Vine. The most important event of its year is about to begin, harvest. The work is done by the keeper of the Great Vine, Jill Cox, helped by gardening apprentice Michelle Cleave. But before picking the grapes, the boxes for them have to be made up. Oh, it seems quite warm in here. What I normally do is put in two pieces of tissue paper in, and the idea is to make a little nest, so the grapes are going to go in the middle, and it's sort of um, crumpled up round the edges. So I, I put in two loosely, just sort of like anything, anything like that will do just fine, you know. 
It's not going to be picky about it. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's all it is, which is nice and easy. Yeah, it looks very smart, doesn't it? Shall so, I have a go? There we are. Jill has looked after the vine for 13 years, but this is Michelle's first oh. harvest. I'm going to pick some down here to start off with because they're handy. But we're looking to pick any that are ripe. And sometimes they look pink and they're ripe and sometimes they look pink and they're not quite. So do feel free to taste them. Sometimes it's the only way. So we pick them in a very traditional way, which is with a handle. Ah, it's <laughs> wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, about an inch on either side right. without the leaf. We'll come mm -hmm. on to the leaves in a minute. We want the, the leaves, medium to large ones, yeah. to go in the boxes. This one looks very nice. I think I've just cut a bit. I'm not supposed to cut, actually. <laughs> Two bunches. <laughs> It's quite exciting because I haven't done this before, but at the same time, <laughs> a little nervous. <laughs> now, when I'm looking at these and sorting, sometimes there's just the odd berry that's a little bit shriveled, or sometimes there's just the odd berry that isn't right when the rest are OK. There's a very pink one there. I won't taste it, but I have a fancy that might be just under ripe. Sometimes, in order to get at them, it seems necessary to hold them a little bit. I'm trying not to handle them because if I handle them too much, it, it rubs off the bloom, and that's their natural matte finish. Uh, and and I, I want to keep as much of that intact as possible. I'm under a certain amount of pressure to pick the 30 pounds every day. You know, it's relentless. The management don't like it if I were to pick a few days and then say there weren't enough ripe for a couple of days. Once I start picking, I'm under pressure then to pick every morning. But nature sometimes has a way of biting back. Last year we had thousands of wasps in here and they were eating whole bunches. You know, it was live with wasps, so it was a bit, you know, <laughs> a bit unnerving. And they, they're, um, they're crafty things. They, they eat all the flesh and they leave the skins and the pips. And they just leave the shell of the bunch and the whole of the rest of it disappears. But it would take more than a swarm of wasps to finish off the great vine. Planted by Capability Brown in 1768, it's believed to be the largest and oldest one in the world. People always seem to be very surprised that they taste OK considering the vine is so old. I quite follow that logic myself, but people seem to think they would have got sour over the years or something, I don't know. But people often say, oh, very surprised it's sort of sweet grapes off such an old vine. Morning. Hello. Hi there, all right. right. Yes, that time of year again. <laughs> The shops are eagerly awaiting the fruits of Jill and Michelle's labour. Good morning. Yay. Hi there. Do you want me to yes, put them on, on here? Put them on here, please. Yes, yes sure. We've got a, a, a lady waiting. She's very anxious to choose them off the box. Oh, good. good. <laughs> From the palace's point of view of making money, the old superintendent, who's long gone now, used to say, you know, they didn't, what they were sold for didn't pay my wages and I used to reply he said this every year and I used to reply every year that's because I'm worth my weight in gold <laughs> and we used to leave the discussion there just a pound that's the sort we like the tapestry has been immersed in a huge metal container of deionized water it's now sprayed with a diluted detergent mix specially formulated for this particular fabric And for the really tough stains, Lindsay and Julia gently massage the textile with sponges to ease the dirt out. We're not actually going to do the whole, the whole surface. We really just need to concentrate um, on the paler colours where um, some of the wool is sort of fluffed on the surface and it's, it's holding quite a lot of dirt. We just want to make sure that they're quite clean. They also measure the level of acidity in the tapestry by taking a pH reading. I'm putting this on the top of the tapestry surface and I'm trying to take a measurement of the water and the pH of the inner fibres. Acidity caused by pollutants in the environment like smoke and human dust destroys the delicate threads. So if the tapestry is to survive, it's imperative its acidity is neutralised. We're monitoring the pH because the tapestry, the pH was um, very acidic. It was three to begin with. 
and um, obviously the wash process is going to chemically change the tapestry so we're going to have um, we're going to change the pH make it less acidic which is going to stop the degradation process so we monitor throughout the water's beginning to look really satisfyingly dirty now. It took a while and I was beginning to get a bit disappointed, but it's now it's lovely and yellow and brown. And they sort of smell like wet sheep. It takes about an hour to rinse out all the detergent, but the tapestry still has to be dried. Long cotton towels act like giant blotting papers when plastic drain pipes are gently rolled over them. and it's given the blow-dry treatment for at least a day. Already the improvements are becoming apparent. The tapestry is now ready to be repaired. After mounting it on a loom, van der Nadolny is beginning the painstaking process of conservation. It's really, really beautiful. The figures, I think the Lego's come out of it very well. I mean, he really looks like he's been done last week. He's been just been made. But Vanda has underestimated the time it will take to do the repairs. You know, when it was dirty, it was difficult to see the work in it also. I didn't take that into consideration because it was so dirty and so matted together. But now that it's been washed and everything's sort of opened out because all the fibres have sort of come up and um, are softer, I can actually see. So I've got more work. And also it was my first project, and so I wanted to... I said I could do that in less time than... Um, and probably I really could. I mean, I'd probably be here till midnight one night with the candles. No, not candles, not in the palace. I'm working my way through the tapestry from the beginning, at this side, right the way through it, and doing basically very minimal conservation work of mainly slits. And slits means I'm sewing up areas that have come apart. For conservation, um, you make something whole again. You make it structurally sound without um, adding to the design in any way. If something isn't there, you can't put it back in again. It's such a fine dividing line, conservation, restoration. Sometimes it's confusing, because sometimes you're doing some work, and it's like around these fingers here. If this was missing, if I didn't put some sort of linear line back there for artistically, aesthetically, um, those wouldn't read as fingers. Yet, if I put too much uh, work into them and actually, like a painter, um, do the tonal qualities around them, I could be interfering with that piece of work, putting my idea of how um, her fingers are, how fat they are, how, how they bend, how they move, uh, the tonal qualities and the shading and the light, and that would be restoration. To do a slit, it doesn't take very long to sew something up, but I'm probably taking twice as long because I'm having to push and pull through the tapestry. This is a very tight tapestry. It's very difficult to put the needle through, and so I'm actually changing needles about every three turns because they blunt and they bend, and I have to change them. I've got a whole huge supply of stocked up. I particularly like 18th century and 19th century French paintings, and tapestry, they are derived from paintings, from cartoons, from prints. And so it's a natural extension. I um, really love French tapestries. They have a sort of quirkiness about them and fun. And their colour, their palette, I can't... And you know, to be able to, with thread, create leopard skin, I think that's incredible. You know, it's such, and to be able to define silk, you can see that something's a silk drape next to flesh and toenails and... Eyelashes, I think, is in, I, I, my, I'm overbold by how they came to do this. And pearls, even, and jewels. I thought it was painted. In fact, I asked someone to look at this because I thought, no, they can't have done that. You can't get the jewel work like this. It can't be. And I thought, gosh, it's got paint on it. Well, it's got paint on it. Perhaps if I'm rubbing against it, it might come off. And it isn't. But the luminosity of that, it looks like it's paint. Can't believe that. So that's why I like them. After many hours of work, the tapestry is ready for a last inspection before it's sent back to Windsor Castle, where it'll be rehung.
finished. Okay. This washed up exceedingly well, and uh, it's stable now. So it'll last the next hundred years, hopefully, without it falling apart. And then the next person, a hundred years later, will do what I've just done. And hopefully they have an easier time. I spent my summer doing this. Not that I regret it. Um, I enjoyed it. But I'm going to have my holiday now. I hope they like it. I'm sure they will. Court, a scheduled ancient monument, has stood the test of time for 500 years. But it's under constant threat from the elements, and it's a battle for the palace to survive the late 20th century. Assistant curator Jonathan Foyle writes an annual report on the state of the building for the curatorial department, the surveyor of the fabric, and maintenance. It's a problem here we have with Rygate stone. It's a funny material because it's not a limestone, it's not a sandstone, it's a mix of the two. And you can clean the windowsill one night, the next morning you'll find some, some fall because this stuff has an inherent disease problem. It looks like diseased skin almost. Um, and that's because the binder doesn't know what it is. It's not one thing or another. So it can't hold itself together. And consequently, we've got to find ourselves a, a solution to, you know, to, to repair the material or try and hold it together as best as possible. That's one of the overriding problems. Flooring also is a problem where we've got this Swedish marble is what Wren used. It can be worn down and can be very difficult to try and replace successfully. You can see, for example, patterns of wear like this corner, where people walk around the corner and, and have gradually put a trough in the stone. Now, <laughs> the stone you see here is a piece of Purbeck from Dorset, which has already replaced some of the Swedish limestone. So this is a second generation stone at least that's still got that curve in it where, where many hundreds of thousands of people a year walk around and wear the stone down. In the 1990s alone, some five million people have meandered through Hampton Court. So it's no surprise to learn that visitors are by far the single biggest cause of damage to the palace. Housekeeping supervisor Helen Smith has some problem areas to show Jonathan. At first sight, it looks like a lot of damage and you think, well, people must be kicking it pretty hard, but no. 700,000 people a year. Easily. That's just daily damage, that. Yeah. It's just coats brushing, mm. hands brushing, feet banging gently against walls, and it's just the hundreds and hundreds of people doing it every day that mm. causes the problem. There are two major and quite difficult to reconcile duties. The first one is to, is to maintain these palaces to the best of our ability, because they are unique in history, and once they've gone, they've gone forever. But secondly, we've got to present them and make them accessible and explain them, because if you don't show their importance, then they're not worth as much as they could be. Um, so we, we, it's a constant battle to try and find the balancing line between those things. The oriel window of the Great Hall is also showing signs of wear and tear. Helen, my favourite part of the palace. Mm. And um, there have been a couple of um, frightening episodes lately. A couple of bits of... Uh, Water falling out of the yeah. joints in the windows there, mm -hmm. and also, do you remember the glass? I remember the piece ago? of glass coming out. Yes, that was odd because it looked like it was broken from the outside in. When Henry VIII built Hampton Court, little could he know it would be right under the flight path of the world's busiest airport. I'm always aware of vibration being caused from aircraft, in particular. And you can, you can walk through the Great Hall when, when Concorde comes over and you can hear the glass rattling, can't mm. you? Anywhere in the palace you can yeah. feel Concorde going over. Yeah. You don't and just it, <laughs> hear it. It undoubtedly causes cumulative um, damage of some sort. If Concorde comes over twice a day um, throughout a year, it's 700 times a year, times 10 years, 7,000 times that happens. And it may, it may take that or longer to see anything happen, but we'll keep monitoring what's happening and, and I think we'll, you know, we'll have to make some sort of representation because sometimes it's just unbearable and this is fragile material. And there are other airborne pests to contend with. But the problem with pigeons is not one of vibration, it's what they leave behind them. To the right of the column, it looks like someone's dropped a pot of white paint. Um, now, what's euphemistically called guano to... Um, those interested in buildings um, can be a real headache to get off a building. Now, 
any sort of um, bird mark that's, that sits on the surface of brickwork actually it embeds itself and forms a very hard crust on the surface. Now, if you try and scrape it off, you take the surface of the brick off as well, and there, there are no solvents which can satisfactorily remove it. So you could try brushing, you could try scraping, but it's a thoroughly unpleasant business, and it's never guaranteed to come off very well. That's only one problem of, um, caused by animals. There's another one actually particular to this area of the palace, which, uh, which is water rats, which scurry up from the Thames, run across the privy garden, so it seems, and <laughs> they've taken to sharpening their front teeth on the toes of these lead statues. Now, I don't know what happens when animals eat lead. I don't know quite what lead does to their brain, but they seem to like it for sharpening their teeth. Um, so we had some damage to the sculptures as well. So rats and pigeons are just a couple of the problems in here. Although it's had so much to contend with, Hampton Court still stands today as one of the finest examples of both Tudor and Baroque architecture. Jonathan will highlight the areas most in need of attention. It looks for, to the outside like we may be keeping the thing on a life support machine, you know, propping it up and putting uh, materials in it to keep it going. But we must remember that Henry VIII had 50 houses, and this is by far the best survival. I just walked around um, six acres of building today. And you know, painting the fourth bridge is a weekend job. It really is. Keeping Hampton Court going is a, is a phenomenal thing. And that's because so much of it remains and so much of it's in good condition. We've concentrated on the areas that are faring least well. Um, and it's not like a life support machine, really. It's rather like a doctor. We tend to a patient to make sure you know, it keeps them in the peak of health. And we're really trying to do the same thing. Um, and, you know, the prognosis would be that Hampton Court's in you know, pretty good shape. Mm -hmm.